thank you, everyone. Um, as thank you for the privilege of being here. It's an incredible effort and an incredible time. I'm joined here by Governor and First Lady of New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you and then also two incredible gentlemen who are really representing the underground work. I'm going to do some brief introductions for them. First, I'm going to start off with Sean Robbins, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Corporate Officer for the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Hence, I will call the Blues. I heard that's the best way to address. The National Federation of 34 independent community-based and locally operated Blue Cross and Blue Shield companies. Today, one in three Americans is covered by the Blue System. As a member of the Blue System executive leadership team, Sean directs public policy communication efforts as well as an overall accountability for the Blues brand. Additionally, he oversees the Blues strategic partnership initiatives, including a newly announced partnership with Boys and Girls Clubs of America and clinical affairs to accelerate innovation and drive meaningful and lasting improvements of healthcare consumers, payers, and providers. I'm now going to go over to our next panelist, Dr. Sri Shagur. Shagaturu, thank you, I'm sorry. But we also indicated that we would address each other by first names, which is wonderful. He is the Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of CVS Health. He leads the CVS Health Medical Affairs Organization spanning Aetna, CVS Caremark, CVS Pharmacy, Mint Clinic, Women's Health and Genomics, advancing the highest possible clinical quality standards, increasing access to care, improving patient outcomes, and reducing overall healthcare costs across the CVS enterprise. I'm going to really stop there for the moment because of uh, time and effort. But if we were here, these, we would be spending a much longer time introducing this incredible panel. I'm going to start off now the discussion, and I'm going to take the pleasure of really Governor and First Lady, your, your initiatives really started one year ago, and as you set the stage with the video, um, you started this focus and ideas in Portland, Maine. It's been a big year, and you've learned a lot. What is one of the things that you stands out most or surprised you most in sort of contributing to the best practices that are represented in this playbook? And I'm going to start off first with the First Lady. And I share your passion in starting from the very beginning with maternal health and infant health. Please let us know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, I just want to quickly say, you know, as the wealthiest country in the world, I think we should all rightfully assume that every mother and baby has the same chance to be born into joy and health. And sadly, that's not the case. Um, for those who do not know, the United States is 55th in the world for maternal mortality rates. Uh, we are lag behind every other developed country, and that uh, differential is only growing. Um, the situation is even more dire, and I'm particularly thoughtful about this, Jim, as I think about your group and who the, the owners of this hotel, but it's, it's even more dire uh, for black, uh, Hispanic, um, our uh, American Indians, and our Alaskan Native mothers, who um, have a rate of two to three times that of a white mother to die for maternity-related complications. So um, the worst part of that is, or the best part is, as we pivot to what we've been doing, is that over 84% of those deaths can be prevented. So for the last year, we have had the luxury of traveling around the country, um, Salt Lake City, to uh, uh, Sacramento, not Sacramento, Santa Monica, Monica. Santa Monica um, to uh, Detroit, um, Philadelphia, and now finally here in Atlantic City. Um, we have met with stakeholders, we've met with moms, we've heard from lived experiences, and we have had the, um, we've now worked with Boldly Go and many others <clears throat> to develop a playbook that some of you have in front of you that has 32 action steps. And these are very, um, very tangible pieces of work, and I'm very excited about it. I would say to you that the 
most surprising piece of this is not necessarily surprising as much as it's an affirmation that no matter where we went, no matter the religious um, background, no matter the socioeconomic status, no matter what community we were in, there is a genuine concern. People love mothers and babies and people want to lean in and make this right. And so I'm really, um, I'm really heartwarmed to know that we as a country all want to fix this. Thank you, First Lady. Governor Murphy, uh, you also had some learnings along the way quite a bit. Can you do some of those re reflections for youth mental health? So the, in the interest of, of the clock, the biggest yeah. um, reflection or reaction that I've had, and I think this is ultimately a good thing, is that strengthening youth mental health is not doctoral calculus. We know exactly what we need to do. I think the same could be said of infant and maternal health. We know exactly what works. The question is, can we share best practices? I mentioned Utah and Colorado, two examples of initiatives I had no history with. We now do, they're now embedded in this playbook along with actions taken at many, in many other states. Share best practices, execute, execute, execute. There is, I think, the reality of funding on some of these steps. I mentioned we had four pillars, 13 subgroups, 35 specific steps. Some of those are literally free of charge. I think the same thing is true in the infant and maternal side. Some of it costs money. So the question is, do we have the will to execute? Do, and where we need to fund, do we have the will to fund? So I view all, all of that. You now, this is unlike a pandemic where you don't have a vaccine and you, you, you're, you're struggling in the dark to find the answer. That's not the case with either of these initiatives. We know exactly what we need to do. We just have to get out there and do it. And that's being reflected, your recommendations also in terms of the practices of our two partners that we have here. What I'd like to hear from Sean and Sri is a little bit about your learnings and your programs as well. I'm gonna start off with Sri and really begin on youth mental health. Could you tell us a little bit about that and your work? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, and thank you so much to the First Lady and Governor and to the National Governor Association for taking on this critically important topics of uh, youth uh, health and uh, maternal health. And so briefly, let me just frame out CVS Health and then I'll dive into how we're addressing these topics. So uh, CVS Health, as you, uh, we're celebrating 60 years now, and you know us as a community pharmacy, nearly 10,000 pharmacy locations, 85% uh, of Americans are within five miles of a CVS location. In addition to our pharmacies, we have Aetna providing healthcare benefits, nearly 25 million individuals, pharmacy benefits through Caremark, 100 million individuals. In totality, that's one in three Americans that are receiving health benefits, healthcare services from CVS Health. And we're really proud of being able to leverage those assets to help support improving American health, such as our most recent in the COVID response. But when we talk about uh, mental health and the youth, uh, part of my role, I have the opportunity as a physician to go around and talk to our clinicians in our various uh, clinics. And I had a conversation actually with one of our minute clinic providers in Chicago just two days ago. And she brought up, uh, as we were talking about this topic, uh, she said, you know, look, I was, I was doing a school physical the other day. And in that school physical, we go through all of the issues that need to be addressed to make sure that the, patient, the, the student is healthy for school. But at the end of the school physical, I said to the student, who was accompanied by her mother, who was a middle school teacher, mm -hmm. that, uh, look, we just talked a lot about your physical health in this physical. But I just want you to know that you should know that you can talk to anyone if you ever have any issues about what you're feeling, what you're thinking, and we're here to help you regardless of those issues. The teacher, the, uh, the mother was also a teacher. She loved that comment. And so the next day she went to her class and said that same comment. Remember, we're here to take care of you. Reach out to us anytime that you want. And she didn't think too much about it. She was just doing her part as a teacher. Later on that, uh, at the end of the day, a student came up and said, you know, I've been thinking about hurting myself. Mm -hmm. And if you hadn't said that, I wouldn't have known that I could reach out to my teacher is not somebody who I would have thought about for addressing my issues. And so, you know, that story was very powerful for me because it really talks about stigma and then also providing tools. And so at CVS Health, as we think about addressing stigma, 
we've invested alongside the Trevor Project to make sure that LGBT youth are uh, given the resources and awareness about how to reach out for uh, counseling. We've implemented a program in our pharmacy called Beauty Mart, where we're promoting real images of uh, body positivity. Uh, so to ensure that uh, individuals know that it's okay to be who you are uh, and beauty comes in many forms. Uh, we've also have an initiative for our own colleagues called Stamp Out Stigma. And every month we highlight a colleague who's overcome mental health and share that story. Most recently we shared a story about an individual who was just overcoming a crystal meth addiction, was able to overcome that addiction, regain her family and to become uh, employed and, and work at CVS Health to show that there is a good side on the other, other end of addiction. And then I'll briefly on tools and tactics, we're empowering clinicians with something called the ECHO Project where we educate individuals about different tactics and tools. Uh, and we have a program called, uh, a company called Resources for Living, which provides employee assistance program benefits for 40 million individuals across the country. And that's for employees, but also for caregivers, because we know we need that totality support. Uh, and we provide care management services for at-risk children. We use analytics to identify who has uh, a chance of suicidality and then intensify our care management outreach for those individuals. Uh, and lastly, with Minute Clinic, we've uh, created a 24-7 mental health service. So you can see uh, counselors 24-7 virtually and in select states in person. And ultimately what we've done is put that all together into a bold initiative for Aetna. For Aetna members, we're striving by 2025 to reduce suicides by 20%. And I'm pleased to announce that we've achieved 18% reduction. Our work is not done, but by working on stigma, tools and tactics, we'll continue to work towards that goal. Thank you, Shri. And I see you looking at things so holistically in every target community employees and on the ground. Thank you. I'm going to turn to you, Sean, also for the Blues as well sure. and work. Yeah, good morning and thanks for having us. And the Blues, you know, have the, candidly the responsibility to partner with providers for 115 million Americans. But more than the number is that this is a personal issue for many of us in this room. This is not a PowerPoint, it's not abstract, it's not a chart, it's not a graph. You know, this touches us, mental health, particularly with youth, um, in a lot of different personal ways. Um, so, candidly, I come to this conversation more from a perspective of my role as a father and a husband and a caregiver than I do as an executive vice president of Blue Cross Blue Shield. But with Blue Cross Blue Shield, we feel like we have a platform and the responsibility with covering 115 million Americans to put the person and the stories that we all bring at the center of this work. Forget the politics, which is why I appreciate the governor and first lady's work on making this a bipartisan issue. It's not red or blue or purple for that matter. But the thing I'd leave you, I'd, I'd start with is, is a, a, a framework for thinking about all of this work and why this moment is really important. For the first part of the 20th century, our healthcare system was designed around making people come to it. The 21st century has to be entirely about making the healthcare system go to people and meet them where they are. And where kids are and where youth are is really different today than where it was when the healthcare system was built over the last century and the architecture of that. So start with that concept that this century is about shifting and pivoting where healthcare mm -hmm becomes a system of going to you and meeting kids where they are, not making the kids come to the healthcare system. And kids go to peers, they go to teachers, they go to community organizations, they go home to their families, to their mothers, to their fathers. These equipping, teaching, educating, navigate than making go to practitioners and offices different and a very fundamental shift in how we're looking at delivering care. Number two, we want to create, we want to, we want to reduce demand for mental health in this country. There are supply issues. Those are acute and those are today. How we fix long-term demand by reducing mental health issues means we have to go upstream 
where kids are, and particularly with the work that Sesame Workshop does, at infant and up to six years old becomes really critical periods. So going upstream, so we're pivoting, we're going upstream, and then we're integrating the care in places back to where the kids are. So last week or two weeks ago, we announced a major partnership with the Boys and Girls Club thinking about healthcare differently. We, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and our provider partners need to invest where the kids are. And in the case of the Boys and Girls Clubs, there's three and a half million kids who go to Boys and Girls Clubs every day in this country. So we are working with the Boys and Girls Club and we're investing $12 million over four years to train 48,000 frontline staff at Boys and Girls Clubs to become trauma-informed, make the centers trauma-informed so that they can equip themselves to de-escalate and to then be able to triage and move children within the healthcare system more intentionally. That will touch three and a half million kids over the next four years. That is a very small piece of a much larger challenge, but it's an example of how we're trying to shift how we think about making people come to us and us, the healthcare system, going out into communities. And that's the reality of the blues is we're in every zip code in this country, covering 115 million people. They're partners to governors. We grew up as local community organizations. We didn't start as a national organization. We started in the 1930s and 40s as local community organizations. And we really think that we need to use our national scale, but pivot to local implementation with our local partners, like here in New Jersey, who are setting up, and again, meeting kids where they are, text-based chats, similar to the programs I'm hearing about in Utah, for example, where the kids are on their phone, this is how they connect. They connect with their peers, they connect with their teachers. They are not scheduling an appointment all the time to come to a mental health care practitioner. So really rethinking how we're building the system of mental health is really critical. And having that framework of us going to them versus them coming to us frames the work we're doing, not just with Boys and Girls Club, but all the work we're doing across the blues. Thank you. At Sesame Workshop, we often call this a circle of care. And what you're describing is that unity of community and going where teachers, individuals, and everyone is. That brings a connection next. And Sean, I'm gonna stay with you for sure. a moment and look at, again, as the First Lady pointed out, in looking at maternal and infant healthcare and look at what you're doing and the emphasis in that continuum. Could you tell us a little bit about that as well? Yeah, and the governor mentioned these are convergence points between maternal and infant health and, and youth mental health, and he's absolutely right. And in the case of maternal and infant health, it is a travesty that in this country that you're two to three times more likely to die as a mother because you are not white. That shouldn't exist in this country. And we have to stomp that out. So one of the things we're doing is we've committed over the next five years to try to reduce severe maternal morbidity, clinical term, SMM, by 50% in this country. The challenge is, and I will tell you honestly, the country is going in the wrong direction mm -hmm. on maternal and infant health. So one of the things we're trying to do, back to putting care to where people are, not expecting care to, magic, uh, to people to come to the healthcare system, folks like in Minnesota, for example, Blue Cross Blue Shield in Minnesota, funding doulas, doulas to be on site, shoulder to shoulder with birthing people and mothers. Really critical. You see increased health quality outcomes, you see reduced costs. So higher quality, lower cost, and it's culturally appropriate care, okay? We're partnering with the March of Dimes nationally to provide bias training inside doctor's offices. We've hit 30 states, thousands of physicians. You've seen the national headlines of very uh, affluent uh, people of color who've either passed away or their infants have passed away or have been challenged through the birthing process. This, does not, this is not an issue that is demographically constricted, income restricted. Uh, this is an issue that touches all people across all classes. So whether it's partnering on the ground, like places like Minnesota, or it's partnering nationally with March of Dimes, over the next five, 10, 15 years, we're working to stomp out this discrepancy. And in some cases, the two to three times is actually an understatement. We think it could be worse. Latino, 
Pacific Islanders, Native American women, black women, are two to three to six to seven times more likely to die simply because of the color of their skin. The last piece I'll say on this, and this is work we've been doing in Washington, D.C., you cannot change what you cannot measure. And historically, measuring from a clinical perspective this work has been very challenged and very difficult. And candidly, we have an antiquated measurement system when it comes to capturing the true identity of individuals within the system. So we're working right now with the National Minority Quality Forum mm -hmm. to reintroduce an industry-led and partner with government measurement system that snaps a clean chalk line in the 21st century versus the last time it was updated in the early 1990s. And I think with better data, more granular data, we'll be able to actually understand and connect what's really happening on the ground with the interventions that have efficacious outcomes. So it's a broad approach of partnerships, partner resources on the ground, measurement that Blue Cross's Blue Shield is mobilizing to try to attack this problem. But it is critical, whether it's youth mental health or it's maternal health equity, frankly, it is not just a private industry solution, it is not just a state government solution, it is not just a federal government solution. This is mobilizing all of the resources that we all have again, to take the care of the system out into the communities and side by side with people and not making people come into an antiquated healthcare system. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And really. And now, Sri, I turn to you because equally, I know as a healthcare organization and being in the community, you have similar sort of systems and approach. And it's interesting to see the commonalities, even though we haven't really spoken together on it. Uh, I'd love to hear from the CVS perspective, really, on maternal health. Yeah, I'll start first with a personal perspective. And I started my clinical career 20 years ago, training at Mass General Hospital, where I continue to practice internal medicine. And one of the worst things to hear in a hospital is code blue, because code blue means that somebody's having cardiac arrest and is, um, needs to be resuscitated. And when you run down, you run down as a team to go resuscitate generally an elderly individual who has multiple comorbidities in for already for a heart attack or some serious condition. I remember in my second year of residency running down to one of these codes and to my shock seeing a young woman who had just given birth who was having a cardiac arrest because of uncontrolled hypertension during her pregnancy, and she passed. Yeah. And that was one of the most shocking moments in my training to see a young woman who wouldn't be there for her child. And unfortunately, that happens three to four times a day in this country, which is just should never happen. And we're at a rate that's worse than Russia, and I think we could all agree that we should not be worse than Russia on anything. And so when we think about how do we actually address this from a CVS health perspective, uh, it starts first with family planning and ensuring that there's uh, adequate family planning resources. And after family planning, there's two major levers clinically that we're really leaning into, which is hypertension control, blood pressure control, as well as vaccination. And through our services with Minute Clinic, we are able to, or our pharmacy, we're able to provide those services directly to individuals in direct care provision, but also in health benefits. What we're using is advanced analytics to identify which of our members would be at high risk for high blood pressure or to be missing a vaccination, a gap in care. And then we reach out to them, but as a consumer company, we're also reaching out to them in a way that fits their consumer needs. Some people are uh, convenience oriented. They wanna know that they can get it in a very easy location in their community. Others are more uh, financially motivated. We wanna say this is low cost, no cost to you. And some people want it digital, some people want it physical mail. So really taking analytics, but putting a consumer bent and really to drive that hypertension and vaccination rates. And in addition, uh, are we, once we identify those individuals, we deploy care management resources, a nurse care manager who then follows and tracks those high-risk individuals through the pregnancy to help support them uh, through their journey. And lastly, as uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, Sean, that it's important for us to invest in communities because it can't be done just through private sector. We've made targeted 
investments in communities where there are high uh, rates of uh, maternal mortality uh, to help support community-based organizations. So it won't be just us alone, but this is both a personal and a professional initiative for us. It's interesting how each of you share personal stories because we see the impact of these issues across everyone and also how you're sharing really that focus on data, individualization, community, and really gathering at all points, whether up here or down in communities. So thank you. Thank you both for that work. I'm now turning back to the governor and first lady. And um, you, we've heard so much from, from these two organizations, uh, their great work in strengthening these around both of these issues. And across really what we hear is at a community, meaning at state levels, it's really on the ground. And what I'd love to know a little bit more is that these playbooks uh, contain so many exciting examples of innovation and best practices, both on youth mental health and maternal infant health. And Governor and First Lady, I'd like to hear a little bit about your takeaways for all of us, or things that you're particularly excited about, about seeing coming out, both from a policy and impact point of view. First Lady, I think, I will start with you, and particularly because you set the foundation with maternal and infant health. Thank you, Jeanette. So listen, there's 32 action steps, and these are, you can cherry pick. Uh, you can do one, you can do all 32. It's, it's, it's really up to the states. I would say there are probably three categories that I would put them in. One, no cost. Uh, ensure that all of your emergency rooms are asking patients when they present, have you delivered a baby in the last 365 days? Very simple. That's one. Secondarily, Medicaid. There are numerous opportunities um, across the field of Medicaid. I would say the next one is expanding Medicaid for up to 365 days post-delivery. Uh, if you haven't done that, please, I'm hoping you will consider that in your state. Um, secondarily, uh, we talked a little bit about doulas, and we, there's a, a suggestion that you reimburse for doula care through Medicaid, uh, particularly communi community doula care, because that is um, very culturally sensitive, and they are embedded in the communities, very, very simple. And then the last one, which is really my favorite, and I think it goes hand in hand with what Sean was saying about 20, the 21st century approach to delivering care, and that is uh, universal nurse home visitation. Um, this is a game changer. This enables a nurse to go into a home within the first two weeks following delivery to not only check on the mom, who normally isn't seen until six weeks post-delivery, but to check on the baby. You take all the stress away from the mom and the baby having to travel to an office. You also remove all the obstacles that that doctor in that office is not going to normally know, like is that mom wearing their Sunday finest to get to the office? Did they change you know, buses three times? How did, what's their, what is their actual on the ground living existence? Do they need <clears throat> connections to other resources, whether it's you know, uh, Wi-Fi access or food security? So it's just a way to really expand all the resources that are already available across all of your states. Um, so all of those, but, but there's a lot. I just hope you'll take the playbook and give someone on your team the chance to look through it and see what, what opportunities there are to really um, change this scourge across the entire nation. Thank you, First Lady. Now I'll turn to you, Governor Murphy. Uh, I wanna jump on something, Jeanette, you said uh, in Sean and Shree's direction and, and just one other takeaway I had from our uh, cross country tour and that is there's nothing like hearing lived experience. Yeah. The very specific stories of moms, kids, folks, family members who have lived through it. And there are a whole bunch of experts <clears throat> who have joined us and many of them attended each and every one of those stops. And there are many of them in this room with us today. And that doesn't diminish from their enormous input and value, but there's nothing like a lived experience. Again, I'm like Tammy's, we've got four pillars, we break it to 13 subgroups, 35 recommendations. It's hard to know, frankly, where to start, but I'll give you two uh, simple ones. Let's get, let's get these kids when they're young. 
don't assume you can get to this when they're already formed. Uh, the, the earlier we can, which is why these are companion initiatives. Uh, and I know that's near and dear to your heart. Uh, in, in her heart. <clears throat> um, and secondly, and Christine Norbert Byer is here, our great commissioner in charge of children and family uh, services. You know, I, I'll give a, a, a Jersey experience. We've been really good at, for a long time, getting at the kids who evidence mental health issues. That's about 2% of our kids. We have about 1.4 million, I think, kids in school in New Jersey. We've not been very good, and this is particularly pronounced since the pandemic, of casting a wider net on the kids who are not evidencing the stress, but may have it bubbling underneath. And so we're now gonna change that in New Jersey in terms of mm. keeping the 2% hyper-focused, but also throwing a broader net. And part of that is, is a little bit like the boys and girls clubs that Sean mentioned, uh, training folks who are not mental health specialists, mostly in this case, educators, to spot the signs where they can then proactively deal with the challenge and, and preemptively deal with the challenge. Um, and, and so those are the two, get them early and cast a wider net. Um, and I think if we did each of those things, we'd probably be in a dramatically better place. Jeanette, could I Thank highlight a, a, just to follow on, Governor, with sure. your last comment, just maybe to go off uh, schedule just a touch. One of the items identified in the governor's um, opinion piece in the Washington Post just a few weeks ago on this issue, I wanna speak personally about this. I am a product of the foster care system. And I think about your role as governors. I'm the Wisconsin foster care system. Thank you, Governor Evers. Those aren't always the happiest stories, however, in the foster care system. I was a lucky one. 80% of kids in foster care have a diagnosable mental health condition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They are often the ones that are left behind in the system. I got lucky. I've seen the other side of where my life could have gone, and I'm thankful and grateful that it didn't. But those kids are kids trapped in a system oftentimes, bumped around, and that's a place where governors and state legislatures can directly lean in and have great effect. And Governor, I thank you for raising that issue and some of the work you've done. Uh, because it's a population that sometimes gets left out of this conversation, but states in particular have a real opportunity to make a difference in. Great Thank point. You. Thank you. Great point. One of the things I, I would like to highlight on that, if you don't mind, is presenting a little bit about Sesame Workshop and the work that we have done and why you exposed a little bit to our Muppets. So we have the pleasure of being a nonprofit global organization whose mission is to help all children grow smarter, stronger, and kinder. But our social impact work is meant to deliver the gaps that we often see as Governor Murphy and First Lady and Sean and Sri indicated, how do we fill the gap of early childhood? One of the things that we have found in mental health, in children's mental health, is very, very strongly that there is a gap in awareness in knowing what is the essential foundation in providing the skills needed for young children to foster their well being, their emotional well being. And also, as you all indicated, the idea of the tipping points of emotional distress. How do we capture that early? How do we do prevention rather than intervention? We've created resources and we continue to create resources that are helping those systems that you all have identified. We've also adapted to how do we get that wonderful image that you've all connected with the brand and with Sesame Street Muppets. How do we get into communities and how do we connect? We look at that circle of care. So we look at integrating within the healthcare system within the child welfare system, we actually created a Muppet who had experienced the foster care system and parental addiction. And also, how do we address the early childhood system and the mental health system? We look forward to being here and maybe having discussions on how maybe we Sesame Workshop can sesamatize some states and bring our knowledge, our evidence, our resources, and our connection and trust to all of you. Right. 
I'm going to now turn really to the governors and, and everyone and get some last thoughts here as we're going forward. Uh, because we're a little bit lower on time and I wish we could have last thoughts, but I can hear several things that emerged from all of you. And that is very much based on the pillars you all indicated in both of your playbooks, that idea of data, of connections in lived experience in going into communities and access, equitable access. But I do want to hear from the governors if there's any questions, thoughts on these experiences or practices that you are also experiencing in your states and based on the philosophy and recommendations from the playbook. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Governor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, just first, uh, let me um, commend the Governor and First Lady. These are the issues that are also plaguing our state. So I'm sure that that's the case for so many of us. Um, if there is a mental health care crisis, especially because of isolation, and we do continue, of course, to see really tragic numbers on maternal fetal mortality. Uh, I would just add that for those who are going to uh, decide in their states where to take this challenge up, also add on top of these excellent points that zip code has tended to be as impactful as genetic code mm -hmm. these days. And so in our states where people are struggling, uh, where our communities are struggling, the zip codes where people have the greatest uh, health disparities and poverty numbers are probably where you're gonna get the biggest bang for your um, mm -hmm. intellectual buck as you go in and deploy resources. Uh, for us, it's in very rural areas, and it does, of course, also tend to overlap uh, with people uh, who have been disadvantaged with less economic opportunity. So again, zip code, seems to be as great or greater than genetic code, uh, but everybody is suffering out there right now. So thank you for taking these challenges. Mm -hmm. Good point. Thank, thank you, you thank you so much. <laughs> Other thoughts? <coughs> yes, yes, Governor Cox, thank you. Thank I saw you. that, sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, and, th and thank you to the esteemed panel. Again, thank you to uh, Governor and First Lady Murphy for uh, your, your courage in taking on this issue. Uh, th this playbook is incredible. Um, we're I, I'm already texting my people back in Utah about some things that we're not doing here. Um, I, I did want to bring up just one issue. It's, it's kind of been touched on, and I, I'd love to offline talk to any other governors who are going through this. Um, we are going through, part of the problem when it comes to mental health generally is, is just a lack of workforce um, in, in this space, right? The need is there, but we just don't have the workforce. And, and what we found, we just did a, a, a comprehensive review of licensure in Utah around mental health work. And what we've discovered is we, we just have a terrible system. Uh, we have 5,000 kids graduating in the state of Utah every year with bachelor's degrees in, uh, in psychology, and they can do absolutely nothing with those bachelor's degrees. Um, uh, the, the, uh, trying to change and align so that we're, um, we're giving people, not, not everybody needs a, a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and yet we have kind of a brick and mortar structure. We're doing a, a little more post-pandemic with, uh, with <laughs> online visits and things like that. But <clears throat> sometimes people just need a friend to talk to. Sometimes they just need somebody who has a little bit of training, not, not all of the training, and, and how to align those pieces better. Um, we're gonna go through that process. I know we're gonna get a lot of pushback um, because anytime you start messing with, with licensure, somebody's ox is getting gored and you know, somebody's not gonna like that. And, and so um, if, if, there are, if there are other governors that have been through this journey, um, I, I would love to hear from you. Uh, I'd love to share with what we're doing and, and the report that we just issued because I think it fits very nicely with what you're doing. So, again, thank you for, for this playbook. We, we need this desperately. I just uh, jump on this, Spencer, for real quick, and I know the clock is not our friend. Um, number one, you're not alone. This is a huge issue and exacerbated even further by, and I think Josh alluded to this, in many cases, the, the psych psychiatric lane is cash on the barrel, uh, really limiting in its ex exclusivity in terms of the actual families that can partake of their services. And secondly, one of the most powerful, one of the reasons I love this guy is one of the most powerful lived experiences that we heard of the entire year was from him personally. 
that kicked us off in Salt Lake. So to you and Abby, thank you for hosting us then and for everything you do. I think we're hearing the same commonalities again about how do we diversify reach, services, and again, reduce stigma. Anything else from the governors? Love to hear. I know this is not a shy group. <laughs> yes. Governor Polis. Um, how do you, uh, let, uh, you know, I, I, and I know many of my fellow governors, very data driven, and we have our challenges in the physical health side, but, you know, laying on how we can compare uh, success rates and you know similar procedures across different hospitals costs you know we're looking out there but but when we look at the mental health space how do we have that uh, accountability for results and 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 there's so much uh out there um the, the standards of care aren't as tight as they generally are on the physical health side there's sort of more variety how do we kind of reward what works punish what doesn't work eliminate moral hazards and you know, actually focus on better patient outcomes as opposed to the self-perpetuating system. I think we should defer to these. Yeah. Guys. So, I mean, at least in the health service, not to get too academic here, but in the health services world, we use the Donabedian framework of structure, process, and outcome measures. And so, as you've mentioned, outcome measures become very hard to measure equally across because of the variability in how we collect that data on a state-by-state -state basis. But still, a lot of what the playbook has is also implementing these structures? Are you following through with these structures and, and those processes? So I would say we need to do a better job, as Sean mentioned, in collecting data on the private sector and the public sector, but also recognizing that we shouldn't over-index just on the outcomes. That's what ultimately matters, but also to measure, are we implementing these tactics and how good are we at doing that? If we look at experience in health services, heart, heart attack care, that was uh, 20 years ago, was exactly what we did, was time to aspirin, PCI, and that focusing on the process actually led to the better outcomes. Um, but this is a good challenge that we need to all address. It's useful, or maybe it's a useful ad. You can decide if it's a useful <laughs> ad for yourself. I think we also, as a language in our society, have to start to bifurcate between this broad term of mental health and mental health conditions. To the Utah governor's comment, not all mental health conditions require acute intervention. Um, and so we as a system have to get better at figuring out what are severe and acute, what are low-grade anxiety, how do we deal with, again, equipping boys and girls clubs, equipping teachers and frontline community providers. Candidly, kids go to peers first. They don't go to you and me. I have two teenagers. They don't come to me to talk about their mental health first. They go to their peers first. So how do we equip an entire generation of kids on mental health first aid in the way that you and I were trained on CPR? I would love to see a country where every child is trained on mental health first aid for, in the same way we were. That's great. So again, the supply side, the workforce side is more than just about the licensed credentialed mental health practitioners in the system. It's sort of an all hands on deck approach. I would add just one second that this idea also of looking the kind of approach that we use at Sesame Workshop, we gather live lived experiences and we also connect with parents and caregivers and getting information both on prevention as well as when there's that tipping point. So collating, collecting qualitative data is equally as quantitative data. Governor, I know we're gonna close. We have eight, seven <laughs> seconds. Seven, the countdown is on. Thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs> Great job. Thank you.